having our seeds come home. And uh, I wanted to start with this photo. This is my um, grandma's hand planting uh, Bear Island Mondamin, which we're gonna be talking about a little bit today. Um, so this was during um, some of our first quarantine, kind of during the uprising in 2020, grandma and I were in the garden behind the Ojibwe school um, planting our ancestral corn. So to start off, I'll have um, my elders here. Oh, actually, yeah. So to start off, we'll have introductions. Um, and we'll do a brief overview of what cedar matriation is and a little seed discussion, watch a video, talk about the history a little more um, and kind of go from there. And for in-person folks, we have some seeds that you all can take home if you're feeling ready for that. So we'll do that at the end. Um, and then anyone at home, you're welcome at the cannery anytime to get seed, just reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to hook you up with some seed from the seed room. But, so... Oh, I, I said I would. Are you going to talk about this, right? <clears throat> yeah, okay. it's you. Okay. It's you. Buju, Minikana Nassab, Gedenoi Maganag. Seeds are our relatives. Um, this is kind of a grassroots collective that um, several of us have come together to start in the Twin Ports area. Uh, we have made connections not only here, but all across Turtle Island. We have people in Canada, over in Michigan, um, Chippewa Falls, uh, Superior in the Duluth area that are interested in educating people and <clears throat> helping to bring the seeds back that were indigenous and promoting those and learning how to steward them. Yeah, so that's what brings us three kind of together is seeds are relatives. And I know, I think there's at least one person online who's been jumping in too for seeds are relatives. Um, get up to Mark, introduce himself. Yeah, Talk you, a little about seeds. You're and My family originally came from Wisconsin Point. And uh, I remember one of my aunties talking about during that removal period, you know, when we get evicted from a place we're renting or whatever, you have 30 days. Well, in many cases, they had two, three hours to gather their belongings and move on. A lot of their, a lot of their harvest was left from their garden. Uh, this work that we've been involved with is really, really important. We, we were over the road drivers for 40 some years. We hauled groceries, everything from chicken to turkey to meats to vegetables to any type of produce. We've been in canneries all over the country and one of the things that we noticed over time was what the sad part that's happening to our, our commercial food system. So I was raised by my grandparents and, and my grandparents always had a big, huge, I mean, their yard was a garden, their whole yard. And they lived off of that all summer long and can canned and put up and preserved and dried and whatever for the entire for the entire year. And people need to get back to that. They need to uh, get their hands in the dirt <clears throat> and get connected. I always say there's you know there's no such thing as a free lunch. Gardening is a lot of work. Just just think about uh, seed rematriation. There's, there's an organization down in Ames, Iowa, that's uh, part of the USDA. And they came up here in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. And, and as late as uh, 1930s, and went around all the different reservations in Northern Minnesota and Michigan, Wisconsin, and they, they collected seeds and were on the hunt to find some of them seeds, to bring them seeds home. Because without that seed rematriation, 
those things that our ancestors grew and enjoyed, we don't truly have food sovereignty. And those two go hand in hand. So that that's one of the things that we're working on. And, and sometimes it gets to a point where it feels like you're beating your head against a brick wall, but when when something happens to click, it really feels good here. So. <laughs> Bonjour, Mary McConnell, Jagamashi Moan, Anongukoi and Dishnakaz, Lizzie uh, and Dogen, Florida and Dunjiba, Gedeo Benang and Dayan. Um, Mary McConnell is my English name. Uh, I'm originally from Florida and I'm living in Superior, Wisconsin with my husband now. Um, for quite some time. We have a hobby farm called Yedigan Maishkam. And back in 2015, I believe, um, I was thinking about how do I save seeds just for myself? And so I didn't have to go buy them because I couldn't find the things I was looking for, but I didn't know anything about it. And across uh, on the internet on Facebook came this thing from Sierra Seeds, uh, week-long seed-saving immersion school. And so I signed up and managed to get scholarship to go and met a uh, wonderful seed keeper, Rowan White, and trained with her for a week. And that started me regaining that connection with seeds <clears throat> and knowing that it was something that I wanted to consider more. Mm -hmm. so, which that's why. I'm and Buju, everyone, I know you all see me kind of every week, um, but there's Wakwe and Dagu, Caitlin Walsh, and Dijin Nakaz, Nikazi and Dudem, Nikazi Yunan, and Dun Jaba. Um, I am here as a beginner seekeeper riding on their coattails basically um shout out to my grandma who's looking super awesome in this photo um <laughs> so i don't know if you all know her at all she keeps herself a little bit but it's uh, my grandma tempe db um for most of my life she lived over in sawyer just down there and her grandma um had a garden uh on her allotment which is you know Davis Road and 280. It's kind of that corner. That's where she, where she would have grown um, a lot of the crops that we're going to be talking about today. So that's just right down the road. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I wanted to talk a little about my my ancestors because that's where I come from, and um, I know maybe there's some people on this call who share some of these ancestors. I'm not sure. I don't know all my cousins, but the one who's in the um, Bottom right corner, uh, woman that's Mishwakwe, the woman I'm named after, um, matrix of our family. Uh, I know she had a garden right by her house and she tended to the plants in the woods to um, rice and all those things that we're um, continuing now, reclaiming now those things. And then, yeah, you see Ava in the racing photo on the right. Um, that's my great grandma. My parents named me after her in English. Caitlin Eve, Eva Katie, that's me. And then um, I always talk about uh, Asada Miban, uh, the light that comes before, or Leland DB. You know, he was instrumental in getting Get On program started back when U of M Extension was running it before Fond du Lac took it on and spent, uh, you know, the latter part of his life trying to get as many gardens and orchards here. And um, didn't mean to talk quite this much, but I know. Uh, my cousin Jason gave me a recording of Leland talking about the Gitagon program in 2008. And even then, you know, he was worried about what he was seeing with the economy, with social security, with climate change, and knowing that our seeds are really our inheritance. That's the community wealth that he wanted to leave for us so that we could take care of ourselves and feed ourselves. So I always want to talk about these ones that are on the screen. Um, because I, yeah, I would barely exist without them for a lot of different reasons. And then, yeah, double whammy named after my great great grandma and my great grandma. Kind of don't have a choice, but <laughs> this works. So, you got for listening. 
Um, yeah, and then Mary's going to talk to us about what is seed rematriation. All right, simply put, um, seed rematriation, it's the process through which these original seeds are brought back to the lands that they were taken from, and also back to that relationship with the people who stewarded and cared for both the land and the seeds. So it's rebuilding that. Um, across the continent, there's this movement that's going on um, that you don't hear a lot about where historically these seats were taken and they're in universities, uh, historical society museums, the USDA uh, seed bank in Iowa, um, the frozen vault. And slowly people are finding these seeds and getting the history of them and getting where they came from and trying to again, grow them out and return them to the tribal lands and to the people, even if they're not still on those lands, to the people who originally stewarded them. <clears throat> and it's, it's really important that this happens for a lot of different reasons. It can be healing, returning those seeds, returning that relationship to the land and working with the different institutions, a lot of healing goes on. Um, working out a lot of the trauma that happened during that time. But also for our health, it's important because these seeds have higher protein count. They have better glycemic index. They were on the land and they were what we used to eat, what our bodies were used to eating. We took care of the land and the seeds and in return, those seeds gave us what we needed to be healthy. So this interaction, this finding, this history, this story, it's part of re remembering who we were and who we are. And it's helping to bring all that together. And those indigenous seeds, they remember the land they grew up in. And they remember adapting to the climate. And as you grow them out, they adapt to the environment and change with the environment. If you keep them stuffed in a drawer or a museum or in Norway, frozen in the vault, and you take them out 30 or 40 years later, it's like waking up from a coma of 30 years and you don't know where you are, you don't know how to be, you don't know what's going on. Seeds are the same thing. What? These seeds are living beings. And so we need to keep growing them out and letting them show us how to adapt to climate change. Uh, I just wanted to double check that the audio and stuff is going okay on the virtual side before we get too deep into the next topic. The audio is sounding good. Good? Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and then, yeah, Mark, anything you want to add about why we do this work? Well, there are, there are living relatives. I like how one person said one time, each one of them seeds is like a little baby with a lunchbox. It's just waiting to be put in the dirt and come to life. <laughs> and I, when we first started growing like the Bear Island Flint, I had no clue really of, of corn. And working with my wife and, and the corn silk and the pollen and, and coming to the realization that a, a speck of that pollen has to get on that, on every one of those fuzzy hairs on that corn in order for there to be a kernel of corn on that cob. Just in, just in that is a freaking miracle, I think. And the more I looked at corn and us growing the, these corns out every year, and handing them out to people that are willing to grow them and, and give some back. It, it's amazing. It's just amazing. So next we were hoping to talk a little bit to the audiences here and at home or attendees. I don't know what is the audience. Um, 
And so we're going to use this tool called Jamboard. So that'll help us put all of our input in one place that we can all see on here. Um, oops, my bad. I just got to click on the link. There we go. Okay. Caitlin, so, yes. Could you stop, share, and reshare again? I'm having a hard time getting the um, PowerPoint to show on the video. Okay. Okay. Um, of course, we're getting some spots. How's that looking? Is it good, Jamie? You're muted. I don't know if you're talking. I know we can see it on the um, Zoom screen in the cannery here. Can people see it at home? Okay. I don't know if we lost Jamie or what. All right, well, we'll get started in person. And if we have to catch the virtual folks up, we will. Um, yeah, Jamie, you can see it. Okay, good. Um, hopefully, we'll, Jamie's still here. Uh, okay, so we just wanted to get to know better everyone that's in the room and, you know, your experience with seats, <laughs> if you want, Teresa, you don't have to. Um, and uh, when it, so we just have some prompt questions, but it's really like whatever is coming up for you about seeds is good. And I don't, you know, I didn't want to, I wanted to provide some framing, but it's not really up to me. Um, okay, so some people know how to use the um, Jamboards online. So I don't know if Isabel could share the link. If people know how to use the Jamboard, if not, um, I have someone on a laptop keeping track of the virtual chat. If you want to put your input in the virtual chat, then um, Isabel can add it to the Jamboard. Um, I think I see Tani drawing some pictures right now. Um, and then people in person, if you talk, then Isabel will take notes through the Jamboard. So all you got to do is talk. So um, some prompt questions, you know, what's your experience with seeds? Do you have seeds that you keep? Um, what do seeds mean to you? Um, why are you at this class even? So if anyone, Anyone feels like sharing? Either no online or in person, totally. No brave souls. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just finished reading The Seed Keeper like a week ago, oh, which is like exactly about this. And so it's really close, fresh in my mind right now. Um, and I haven't saved, I've been saving my own seeds from like, uh, little herbal gardens that I've been making, but I've been traveling for a very long time, so I haven't been stable enough to get into that yet, but it's very exciting to me. Thank you. And what's your name? And where are you from? Megan. I'm from uh, southern Minnesota originally, but uh, I've been hanging around Finland, Minnesota for a while. Oh, nice. And what's going on with you there? Uh, thank you. You got that, Isabel? Summary? And it's, yeah, Sea Keeper by Diane Wilson, right? Yeah. 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 So, Diane is one so of the cool. matriarchs. Yeah. <laughs> that is for really sure. cool. Highly recommend that book or just looking at Diane Wilson in general. And anyone else here in person? My name is Elena, and this is my fiance, Lauren. And uh, um, I just remember as a kid, you know, like, that was one of the really exciting things for me as a child was like, I came from a really big family. So we always had like this big garden plot cut out. And I just remember, you know, my dad, like he would always, he would always just like go around and collect all these seeds from like these farmer people or like, <laughs> I'm sorry, not farmer people, but like these farms and stuff mm -hmm. like from around the area and people that we knew. So that was kind of cool. It was like his own little collection that he was starting for us. He still has some of those seeds to this day. So I don't know, I guess that's kind of what inspired me to. And like, I went away from that for a while, you know, and I kind of started living like a city life. And then I moved here four years ago. And my mom was like, you should get into the gig on like, you know, 
like you said, grounding yourself, like really, you know, rooting yourself into home. It was kind of like a way to bring myself home in a way. So I think that's why I want to pass it on to my next generation too and really take it up now. So it's cool. Um, like a seat for sure yeah thank you so much for that i just wanted to say that um jamie just messaged in and said her computer seems to be frozen but she can hear and see okay um she said that i don't have access to mute unmute or access the chat participants okay. <laughs> yeah so isabel if you're able to you i think you're keeping track of the chat right yeah. and then um Hmm. I wonder if I should have you record too, just in case that fails. I'll make you, can I make three people co host? It's kind of, yeah. Have so if you want to hit record, Isabel, on your computer too, that would be a huge help. Or no, on Zoom. Yeah, I think it's currently recording. It is? Okay. Yeah. Great. Sorry about that. Thanks for the update, Jamie. Um, anyone else in the room? Otherwise, there's there's plenty on here too that we could add to. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, anybody noticed in the last three or four years because of the pandemic, how many more people took interest in growing their own food? Because they slowed down. It's like, you can't depend on the fairy government to <laughs> come put your meal on the table. Each one of us is responsible for ourselves and our spouse and our children and our grandparents. It's time that people wake up. I remember my elders telling me that when I was growing up, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And if, if something happens, you can't depend on somebody else to feed you. I know we're in a position we could feed all of our neighbors, our surrounding neighbors. You know, we could take care of each other. But we don't grow, they do grow. What I don't hunt, they do hunt. Uh, it goes right back to the, the, the shortage of canning supplies, the shortage of canning lids, all of that. If it's, you know, we struggled for years talking about this. What is it going to take to wake people up? And then all of a sudden, oh, we can't get no lid. Hey, we can't get no mason jar. Hey, yeah, like everybody's getting into it. This is like cool. People are starting to wake up. <clears throat> because me and this woman have been in, we've been in the hunts and dole and you name it. We've seen what happens to the food that gets put on the shelves in the grocery store. And when we finally pulled the pin and retired, we said, we, we ain't buying that stuff. We're gonna grow our own. You know, We wonder why young kids have ADHD and all, all of these things that are going on in, in our lives. You know, get back get back to that soil. And I like starting with the young ones. Mm -hmm. I've, had, I've had mothers say, my kid ain't putting their hands in the dirt. They don't like it. No, they don't like dirt. No. <laughs> and, and you know, they, they got their arms in there, you know, and they're scooping it up, and putting the plants in it, covering it, watering it. <laughs> they love it. They love it. Especially when the first tomato that comes <laughs> off and they eat it, it's like, wow, I really like that or celery. I don't know how, how many of you have ever had homegrown celery, but if you ever had, you would never ever buy it again in the store yeah. because the stuff in the store is good. <laughs> it, it has no taste, but it's grown in the desert with petrochemicals. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any last comments before we can we could take a look at the virtual okay. event? Yeah, yeah, Deb Northrop, I think we went to Food Sovereignty Summit how many years ago, Mary? Five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Opened my eyes to seeds and the great stories of seeds. And I think one of the most powerful teachings I got was from a woman named Lolly Alan Aguilar. She yeah. told me that when you plant your seeds, put it on there in the corn and before you plant it because that 
farm will read your DNA and give you what you need. Very, really powerful. But I remember yeah. going up to a gas station and I met an Iroquois woman there. She goes, hey, you've got to have seed savers on seed swap. Do you got seeds? I said, no, I don't. I just have wild rice. She goes, she opens up her van and there's this whole <laughs> bunch of seeds and she goes, how many varieties of seeds are of corn? I'm like, geez, um, this is how limited I was. And I'm thinking, well, sweet corn. <laughs> really, really not there. So a thousand ninety something, 91, I want to say. I'm like, wow. So seeds are just got all that magic, I guess. <laughs> if we can keep them. Still learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. look, look how upset we get when, like, the paddy race cross contamination with our yeah. wild lake race. And, and that's in the whole food chain. You know, we deal with that with corn. You know, if you're going to try and grow a certain strain of corn, you have to make sure that your neighbor down the road on either side isn't growing some oddball Northrop King F1 <laughs> hybrid something or other so that you're been contaminated. Right in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, and then I'm seeing, um, Isabel, do you know which ones are the virtual ones, like offhand? Uh, I'm not real quick. They're kind of all mixed up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but I think I see tobacco seeds from a tobacco pouch making class. I hope to grow a Samo one day. I hope to reconnect and grow with my culture. So good. Um, I'm learning to save seeds. I have saved some of my tomatoes and I have plans for saving beans and squash this summer. Oh, uh, last summer, I was blessed to be able to grow Bear Island Flint. Amazing. So, um, and yeah, I can share, I can um, share this at the end of class too. So you all have a little keepsake from the class. I'll send a follow-up email with all this, but um, yeah. And then was there anyone in here that I just totally squelched by not recognizing? Does anyone have anything else to say? Okay. So we'll switch. Hopefully this will go back to the presentation. Okay. Okay, so um, now that we did some talking, we're gonna watch a video. I think we have time, right? Yes, plenty of time. Um, so this this gives a, kind of an overview of the seed rematriation, seed work um, all across Turtle Island. So you'll see seed keepers from all over um, in this video. Um, and then a little, uh, what am I trying to say, animation which shows, I think, the creation story that a lot of indigenous peoples have. And if you look at, yeah, our creation story with Sky Woman, she comes down with seeds, right? Mm -hmm. and, and everyone has their different. creation story. This was put together by a group of people with NAFSA and funded by Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And they, a group of people within the seed movement and teachers and leaders in this movement came together and put put this together. Enjoy. We don't have popcorn, sorry. <laughs> we don't need what? I gotta double check my study. Yes, there are tips. Sound <coughs> optimize and then I get hide the controls. Yeah, that leaders fear dance in flight. 
Expands to Highland Pangea, stands Scott Woman Tree of Life. Across Turtle Island, there is a growing indigenous movement of the grand rematriation of seeds and foods back into our communities. Some have been missing for centuries, carried on long journeys in smoky buckskin pouches, encircled around the necks of peoples who were forced to relocate from the land of their birth, their ancestral grounds. Some were carried away by trade or by theft from indigenous homelands. Through displacement and acculturation of settler colonialism, some were completely lost in their communities of origin. Generations later, these seeds are now coming home. From the vaults of public institutions, seed banks, universities, and seed keeper collections, some laying upon dusty pantry shelves of four-sided elders, seeds patiently sleeping and dreaming, seeds waiting for loving hands to place them in welcoming soil once more. seed rematriation is a deep intergenerational prayer. This is powerful healing work of cross-cultural reconciliation. This work is cultural, spiritual, legal, political. This is seed justice. Seed by seed, variety by variety, food and seed networks, restoring the commons of nourishment. New ceremonies are being initiated to welcome home revered ancestral plant relatives. As we carry these sacred bundles of our seed relatives home to their mother communities, we reawaken time-honored relationships. Native farmers and gardeners, tribal community members, institutions and organizations, communities working towards rematriation of their precious seed relatives. When we come together to cultivate the earth and sing our seed songs and prayers on behalf of future generations, we embody the great generosity and benevolence of our own beloved Mother Earth. Those agreements that our ancestors made with their plant relatives, they run like wild rivers in our blood and our bones. And so there's an invitation for all of us, no matter what your ancestry is, 
we all have a responsibility to engage with this work of rematriation. So even just picking up a seed and beginning to grow that seed, it will rehydrate those agreements inside of you and bring this beautiful remembrance up from your very core. to dry out seeds for rematriation because mine get moldy. <laughs> the only ones that will dry out are poppy seeds. There, um, for seed saving skills, we're going to have another class. Oh, okay. I don't remember what dates. It's, oh, maybe yeah, it's, it's in the May good. classes. So, it's like May 4th or something like that. Yeah, so... Um, I don't know. I don't think Erica's here, but Erica's getting the May classes organized. And so seed saving skills we'll get into more. Um, but we can definitely talk to you after class about okay. that too. Um, so you can get more into the practical aspects of seeds. Um, okay, let me figure out the presentation again. <laughs> Monster I might have to skip forward one more time. Sorry. Oh no. Give me one second. <clears throat> no stuff happens. We were talking about the the history and the fact that you know early early years of this country, the government sent people out not only across this country but globally looking at food, lumber, clothing plants, anything that could be turned into a commodity for the economic development of this country. And if and looking in the area, it was being sold, uh, traded. They took samples, wrote up about it, brought it back to this country, which is kind of how the USDA seed bank got started because some of the seeds have been in there from that early time. Um, anybody can look it up and go in and look for seeds in there. It is not easy to find seeds because the history, the location are not with the seed. You look up corn, ZMAs, and there are 4,000 varieties under this ZMA, 2,000 under this ZMA, and all it says is ZMAs. It doesn't say where it came from, how it was collected, who it was from. There are ways to search through that, but it takes a little bit of work. That, that's kind of how that bank got started and how a lot of our original seeds wound up in that where they were collected everywhere. And we were told in this area that we weren't farmers, we weren't gardeners, we were hunter-gatherers. Um, that isn't exactly accurate. There's a whole section, if you look on the Glyphwick map, 
now the name for it is the great gardens on islands and in areas where there was sun and there was good soil people traveled from fish camp to sugar camp to berry camp to the area where they planted the gardens and then they would go and do this and let the gardens grow and then go back and families stewarded varieties of seeds and varieties of squash for the community, not just within their own family. So trying to reestablish that and get some of those seeds back um, from that. Others were traded and they wound up in non-indigenous hands and wound up in a seed catalog with somebody else's name on it. Um, those same varieties, if they haven't been hybridized or modified, last gem corn is what they call it Indian corn. So they're out there <clears throat> wanting to be taken care of again. Anything to add? Yeah, you, you, you can't go to the grocery store and buy a bell pepper or no matter what it is, bell pepper, anything, and save seeds out of that and expect to get that and grow it. We always talk about reputable seed companies. We deal with three or four for like our carrots and our celery and things like that. There are some plants that you have to grow and then dig up and put in a root cellar and then put them back out in the spring in order to get seed from them. And we just don't live in a climate where that's conducive for a lot of things. So any seed that you get, make sure it's from a rep reputable seed company. And I always tell people the same, same latitude for uh, on Washington, don't buy your seed from some place and in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, or someplace in California, because that seed isn't acclimated to this part of the country. It, you can grow it out year after year after year, and it will become acclimated, but you're better off to buy seed from a reputable grower or from get free seed for those of us that are willing to share the seed for getting a little seed back to put in that bank. So that mm -hmm, other people can do it. That's the whole idea of it is to help each other. Mm -hmm. help you. And the more you the more you get your hands in the dirt, the more you're gonna want to get your hands in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. And so I think this book that I'm referencing here, Holding Our World Together, Ojibwe Women and the Survival of Community, it, it talks a lot about our food systems as being primarily matriarchal, noting that um, a lot of history of our two-spirit people has been erased, so I don't want to act like it was all women. There's no way it was just women, um, but I wanted to highlight this part, so it's, um, we, in I don't know, and like the regenerative agriculture movement, and then even in planning for um, work that we do here at Fond du Lac, you know, we talk a lot about like, oh, you know, the indigenous ways of growing or production farming, like those are the two options. And that um, I know that uh, people who are newer to this area learned production farming from us and our crops, the, you know, those corn, beans, squash, even potatoes, those came from us. And, you know, we grow, grew food in a massive way and in a systematic way and distributed it that way. And so I just want to assert that reality instead of repeating the myths that we get fed a lot and we run into on a daily basis, um, really um, marginalizing how we grow food. And, um, you know, they like came and saw a bunch of Ojibwe women, um, what, like, tying wild rice plants together and working really hard in the fields and saving seed every year and carrying it with us when we migrated and those things. And um, it wasn't respected from a colonial lens, but um, talk about power and building whole worlds. Um, so I wanted to note that and then just that, that image of um, these sites comprised a fertile belt of islands where corn had been planted for generations beyond memory. So remembering ourselves as 
um, air contracts. And yeah, so it's picking oh. up corn. Bear Island flood <clears throat> was grown here all the way halfway up through Canada. Um, the seed that this corn came from was in the USDA seed bank. And it was found, it, it was originally gathered from Bear Island at Leech Lake and put into the history, seed bank history. And it was found and a couple of people got, because anybody can get seed from the seed bank, they will give you 10 seeds for educational purposes. There's a form you fill out and turn in and you can get your seeds and it doesn't cost you. Two different people got 10 seeds each, threw it out. One of them was at White Earth and one was elsewhere and started growing this out from these 10 seeds each and slowly building that pool of seed. Uh, when I originally got it, I got it from White Earth Land Recovery, their seed library from Zach Page. I also got some from a gentleman in Michigan who had grown it. Um, I got some at a seed swap in Iowa. In a, Seed conference, no, Michigan, when I went to the Food Sovereignty Conference there. And I got one from a, a gentleman who grows it in Finland, Corey Melby, who lives in Finland, who um, was growing it out. And so slowly over time, we've been building it. Sharing, because as it grows here and here, it picks up from that soil and gather strength. And it wasn't very strong those first few years because it had been not grown out. It had just been sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And slowly over time, it has built up. I don't have enough room to put in 200 plants, which is what they recommend for seed saving or genetic diversity. But you can do it a little different way, which is what I did. Got some from Corey, got some from Zach, some from the gentleman in Michigan, and planted it all together. And if you've got different people growing it and you pool it, you can still achieve that genetic diversity and that strength in it without having to grow 200 plants everywhere. I put in 25 or 30 plants every year. And then I find somebody to swap some seed with to keep that mixture going. So, but I grew it out and started passing it out. Wound up giving it to Caitlin, sent some to Redcliffe, um, sent some down in the southern part of the state. My neighbor around the corner from me grew out some. It was grown out here. So, and slowly coming home and spreading back over that whole area that it used to grow on. It's a 60-day corn. It's a short season, shorter corn, but it is a flint corn. You have to relearn how to use it. Um, you have to take the hull off of it, and then you can grind it. You can dry it in hominy, dried hominy, so you can store it forever to make soup or add to things. So we just have to learn how to re re-eat along with replant and reconnect. Not yeah. And this corn has a 19% protein and it's really healthy glycemic index for those people who are diabetic. It's not a sweet corn, but it has a really good earthy corn flavor. So that is the history of the Bear Island plant. Prior to that, I don't know the history. You'd have to go to Leech Lake and ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when she talks about that seed from the vault, she means literally the seed that's in that jar. That's like, that's from that same seed. And that's then generations um, later, several generations later. Yeah. And um, the last couple of years, we've grown up that seed in the little seed garden by the Ojibwe Motarida immersion 
program. They're out on what's that road? Redwater Road. Mm -hmm. um, if you see a high tunnel, that's where the seed garden is. And so we grew some of the, some seed last year, um, last growing season, and that's what we'll be including in the plant seed giveaway this year. And then I'll have plenty if people want that seed. Um, and I still have there. a bunch. So, yep. Um, um, and then shout out to Marilyn just in that picture. Um, she grew out some light. corn for us so that we had more diversity. And then I think Kelsey Murray is on this call. Um, she grew out some corn for us too, which I'm so grateful for. Yeah. Got There's more seed a diversity. question on Zoom. Yeah. Um, uh, don't you have to plant the same type of corn so it doesn't cross pollinate? I think they're referring to gathering seed from different people and planting them all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so each grower will have to be careful with that because um, corn is very um, I got seed from flowing. people <laughs> that I trusted had done the right thing and grown it in the right way. You do have to be careful with that. Squash and corn, they're not hard to grow. You just have to take extra care and extra steps. Where I live, I'm surrounded by pine trees. And the only person who was growing corn anywhere near me was Marilyn from that picture. And when I asked her what variety she was growing, she didn't plant that year because I explained what I needed to do. You can work with your neighbors. It, it forges those relationships. Um, there's things you can do. Someone told me to plant two different varieties timed apart because they'll bloom at different times. Corn talks to each other. They say, hey, we're partying over here, and the other one comes up and they bloom at the same time. So. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. So, we have some resources at the end of the presentation that talks about seed saving skills and things like that. How do we steward seed in a good way? Um, so, that's there. And then we'll have a seed saving class too. Um, and then also a hominy and corn cell class so we can get some of those skills on how do we live with our seed every day. Um, and so, we only have a few minutes left. So, I just wanted to end with. Um, a little discussion. Um, so just look, thinking about the future with our ancestral seeds. And um, this is my niece Phoebe at Gitagan Wakandiwag or feast in August. And in her, you know, infinite toddler wisdom is blowing dandelion seed all over. And I'm so proud of her. Such good food, such good medicine, makes good tea. So much you can do with dandelion and love this girl for doing that. Um, so we'll go to the jam board one more time um, to close out the class. Um, yeah, so this one is, um, so this kind of our mission statement is remembering our connection to the land, our ancestors and food by caring for the seeds. And so just wondering, you know, what you learned today or what came up for you that you're gonna take with you um, what else do you want to learn about seed rematriation? I hear a lot of people craving practical skills, which is great. Um, and then um, what can we do to better serve the community as seed keepers? Um, how can we help you be a seed keeper? Um, and then what action steps are you going to be taking? Um, anything that's coming up, uh, Isabel will be taking notes. So anyone? Have anything they want to share to close this out? Yeah. yeah. One of my first questions would be, what's an easy thing to start with? Because as with anything, when you learn, it's like you can do everything, but where it's like a beginning point. Beans. Beans. Across the board, the easiest things. They don't cross-pollinate. You plant them, you water them, you care for them, you leave the beans right on the plant until frost. Really? <laughs> easiest, easiest one to do. Yeah, and if you don't grow, which is okay, if you aren't going to be the one actually stewarding the seed, just learning about our seeds, um, starting to eat our foods that come from seeds, again, um, from our ancestral seeds. I think that's just being having an eater is so important. Yeah, having this conversation, um, helping our youth to learn about being connected to the land of where their food comes from and the history of their food. Key in passing this forward. It, it's past time to wake up, everybody. Past time. We were part of a seed talk here not long ago, and they talked about of the tens of thousands of seeds, just vegetables, seeds, stuff that, you know, carrots, celery, okra, blah, 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 blah. Less than less than ten percent of that 
of the tens of thousands of seeds that a hundred years ago were available to everyone. In, in any seed catalog that you picked up, you could order it. We're down to less than 10% of that because all these big corporate seed companies have scooped up these seeds and put a patent on them and then altered them so they're not they're not true anymore that first time you plant it you get what you get but if you save seed from it you're going to get a, a monster pepper or who knows you know or future discussion you can undo that yeah <laughs> it just takes a lot of years to do so <laughs> a lot of years of growing you had a question in the back yeah <clears throat> or kind of listening to all this and seeing how important it is that i bring my granddaughters with me every yes. time i garden yes. I pass this yeah and to these here. classes our children are more than welcome. Yeah. I love the cool. Please bring all the kids you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You're bring stuck your here. No bring your, bring we, your siblings. We bring work a lot siblings. with school kids over in the superior area. And I found that the, the younger the kids, the more they absorb it. The teenagers, they just want to sit there on their devices. They, it went in this year and out the other year. If you asked them, well, what was your best part? Of it? So, what? <laughs> but the little ones, they get it. They really get it. And, and they, they may walk away, but they wind up coming back. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else for our little jam board over here? I don't know what else to call it. Anything else that people want to share or anything we didn't cover that you want us to cover next time? Yeah, well, um, we're about at time, so I totally understand if um, folks online need to get going. Um, I think like just the last bit here was we were going to talk about um, the seed bundle. So. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about this already, just like if you're ready to steward seed, it's okay if you're not a seed keeper. There's, there's so many different roles and that's okay. Um, and then we have some seed which people can grow up for food or for seed um, today in person. So we can, if you all have a few minutes and want to get some seed. Can you explain the process if you were to grow it for seed? what that means um not right now okay not enough time but I'm, uh, we have resources and we can help you if you're trying to grow for seed it depends on what seed it is and yeah um, what seed it is. yeah saving save the best eat the rest yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and then just yeah for the giveaway we'll have um a selection kind of like this um available for folks if you want to think about it and come back on june 3rd um, we'll, we'll probably have a table with um, little bundles of just the seed that we've been growing out in addition to the seed that we bought to give away um, to everyone. Um, and again, growing for food is great. I don't, it's, I want that, all of that is good. So, and some resources which I can send out. Um, this building is a resource. We have seed saving equipment like screens and such. Um, here we have a big old winnow wizard, which you saw at the beginning. Uh, the producer training program is a resource. The getting on program is a resource. We're resources for you. And then we have books and videos and things listed on here. If you want to learn more, podcasts. There's some really good podcasts. Um, yeah. Uh, and then be sure in person to fill out your assessments. And um, online, there should be a link for you to fill out the survey. Um, anything else you want to add, Mark and Mary, before I close this out? No, wish for coming, wish for listening, listen with your heart. <laughs> Have the conversation, even if it's not with the seed keeper. Keep the conversation going with your neighbors, your friends, your children. The more people hear about it and learn about it, the more success we'll have going forward. These seeds are our ancestors and they're our future. Do you have a sugar?